Welcome to webinar 3, Tools and Techniques, where we look at the importance of processes and ways of analysing these. We then look at measurement for improvement and introduce you to the idea of statistical process control. Many quality improvement methods in healthcare are directed at improving processes. All work is a process. Healthcare processes are the steps that are taken to involve, either explicitly or implicitly, and whether in sequence or in parallel, by people or machines carrying out activities that are designed to improve or maintain health. As an example, the process of a referral to hospital can involve the decision to refer, which is a cognitive process, following discussion with the patient of his or her needs or wants, the communication, for example through a letter, transfer to the hospital, then an electronic appointment, letter or telephone call to the patient to let him or her know a date or time of an appointment. Improvements can be achieved by understanding processes, by mapping the steps involved and analysing these, and we do this to eliminate wasteful steps and reinforce steps that deliver better care. Our aim is to reduce unintended variation, increase reliability of processes and deliver high quality care consistently. The logic model is a useful starting point for understanding and improving processes. A logic model defines what exactly we are trying to improve, our aims or priorities for improvement, describes who we are trying to improve it for, the intended population, and explains why we are trying to improve a particular area of health care, the problem identified as in need for improvement. The model next describes the inputs, and these include people, work methods, equipment, materials, environment and measurements. It also describes how we'll go about improving care in terms of who will involve the participants, what they will do to bring about improvement, the activities, and what we wish to achieve in terms of processes, the outputs that are intended or have been shown to lead to longer term benefits. The benefits are described in terms of health or wider gains as possible harms, the outcomes, whether intended or unintended, and whether in the short, medium or longer term. Various activities can help us understand the elements involved, and this can be used to improve them. The problem, population of interest and priorities for improvement can be elucidated using interviews or surveys of patients and staff, or direct observation of processes. The series of steps in a process of care or patient journey can be shown pictorially using a process map. This can be constructed very simply by writing down the steps of a process on post-it notes and connecting these on a large piece of paper, for example using arrows. This is best done with the team or group involved in the process concerned with improving it. Constructing the process map leads naturally to analysing and improving it by removing redundant, unhelpful or duplicating steps all of which waste time and resources. The process map, as well as showing these redundant or wasteful steps, can also help us identify which steps in a process are critical to quality. These measurable characteristics of a process, where standards need to be achieved to meet the quality requirements of the user, can be summarised using a critical to quality tree. Inputs can be expanded, either as a whole or in specific areas, to form a cause and effect diagram. These are sometimes called fishbone or Ishikawa diagrams. The diagram helps elucidate the causes of a problem and is an aid to finding solutions. The central line represents the patient pathway leading to the outcome of interest and this is affected by various inputs including patients themselves, healthcare staff, work methods and organisational processes, equipment such as machines and materials and the environment, which incorporates features such as policies, guidelines, protocols, and organisational culture. Processes can also be summarised using a driver diagram. Driver diagrams enable high-level improvement goals to be translated into a logical set of underpinning goals or primary drivers, and specific actions or secondary drivers, and these can also be converted to measures. The driver diagram shown represents the stages involved in improving the reliability of a process. The first stage involves preventing failure, which can be achieved through standardisation, using guidelines and protocols, checklists for practitioners, feedback to individual staff or groups, and education and training for staff. The next stage involves provider prompts, 
and forcing functions, which are a means to prevent failure by ensuring that a critical to quality process is completed before another action can be undertaken. The final stage involves further redesign of the system to ensure that the process is as lean as possible, minimising wasteful steps, reducing rework, reducing the chances of failure and maximising the efficient delivery of the process. As we said earlier, all work is a process and measurement itself is a process that not only helps us to assess other processes but can also be used to drive improvement. Different types of improvement project use different types of measurement but not all are equally useful or informative. Measurements are generally of three types, before and after, continuous assessments and comparative assessments. We're going to talk about each of these in turn. Clinical audits characteristically employ before and after measurements, where standards are compared before and after an intervention. The advantage of this approach is that it provides the analyst with a target to aim for, and it's usually simple to analyse and present. A disadvantage is that the standard may be arbitrary. Furthermore, and most importantly, a change comparing a single measurement before and after an intervention may be an artefact of measurement rather than demonstrating a real improvement. Quality improvement projects tend to use data that repeatedly measures processes over time. Rather than two measurements, i.e. before and after, multiple measurements are taken before, during and sometimes after the intervention has taken place. Relatively simple statistical methods are then used to analyse whether the process is showing a natural or random variation over time, and if so, can demonstrate the extent of this variation and whether real improvement over and above the natural variation is occurring. The advantage of this approach to measurement is that it helps us understand whether real improvement has taken place, and it can demonstrate the extent of this improvement. It avoids interpreting natural variation as real change, and it enables us to see the effects of multiple interventions over time. The disadvantage of this method is that measurements need to be taken repeatedly during the process of change, and some basic analytic concepts and techniques need to be learned. This slide shows similarities and differences between measurement in clinical audit and plan do study act cycles. Both follow the model for improvement, measure against criteria, and are cyclical processes for measurement and change. The main differences are that clinical audit is an assessment against a standard, whereas Plan Do Study Act cycles aim for any improvement from the baseline. Clinical audits measure before and after an improvement, whereas Plan Do Study Act cycles allow multiple improvement interventions and measures continuously over time. Clinical audits do not account for natural or common cause variation over time, whereas Plan Do Study Act cycles do. Every measure of a process or combination of processes or an outcome will show variation over time. Variation is therefore part of any process. It's inevitable, but it is amenable to measurement and control. If we want to demonstrate improvement, it's essential to select the key variables to measure quality in terms of outputs or outcomes that will signify improvement. The natural variation of a stable process, unaffected by external factors affecting it or attempts to improve it is called common cause variation. We see common cause variation in, for example, repeated measures of blood pressure. These may be due to changes in the physiological state of the individual, subtle differences in measurement technique, or in the response to the measuring instrument. Variation that falls outside common cause variation is termed special cause variation, and this is often caused by an external factor whether this is planned or unplanned, intended or unintended. Any improvement in a healthcare process requires a change in the process to reduce the effect of common cause variation and to trigger a special cause variation that represents a significant improvement. Responding to common cause variation as though it is special cause variation has the opposite effect to what is it intended. It may actually make things worse and increase the variation in the system. This is called tampering. An example of tampering is when an organisation responds to a single reduction or increase in a measure before checking that the change is due to common cause variation. A strategy for correctly responding to special causes calls for investigation and explanation, and this will sometimes lead to specific changes depending on the special cause identified. Common cause variation requires a different approach. 
A common course strategy firstly requires us to explore the variation more closely using stratification to reveal any special causes. Next, one should seek to understand variation through the processes and systems that cause a problem. And finally, we should redesign processes to reduce inappropriate and unintended variation in an agreed measure in a way that's responsive to patients' needs. Run charts are the simplest way of plotting data in chronological order. Data for a particular indicator plotted as dots or data points on a simple graph with time plotted on the x-axis and the value of the indicator plotted on the y-axis. The time interval should be ordered and sequential but not necessarily equal. They're often regularly spaced but need not be. At least 16 dots are usually required to see if a process is stable. The dots are connected by lines and a centre line, the median, is drawn. Shown on the slide is a run chart showing hypnotic data for a single general practice. There are a number of rules for run charts. A run is one or more data points above or below the median. Common cause variation is represented in a run chart as runs randomly distributed about the median. Three simple statistical rules have been developed to show whether there has been a significant change in a measure over time. These rules are helpful because they prevent individuals or groups just eyeballing a chart of measurements over time and misinterpreting them. Following these rules leads to consistent interpretation of what constitutes a significant change over time. This also prevents an inappropriate response to common cause variation as if it were a special cause. The three rules that identify the most important types of special cause variation are shifts, trends and runs. A shift is a sequence or run of seven dots above or below the median. A trend is a sequence of seven dots all going upwards or downwards, where dots on the same level are excluded from the count. A run is a sequence of dots above or below the median. Runs should be randomly distributed about the median when there is only common cause variation. Therefore, we can calculate if there are the right number of runs, depending on how many dots there are in total in the chart. And we do this using a probability table for runs, which is shown in the next slide. Two special causes are shown in the run chart, which represents the rate of hypnotic drug prescribing in a general practice. In the sequence of 25 dots, there are 11 dots below the median from January 2008, indicating a shift. In addition, there are only four runs when we would expect between 10 and 16. Control charts are a chronologically ordered sequence of at least 15 to 20 data points, with data points connected by lines, a centre line, in this case the mean, and upper and lower control limits. A control chart is a more sophisticated form of run chart. Control charts are more sensitive at detecting special causes, but are also a little bit more complex and require greater resources to construct. The principles of their construction and interpretation are very similar to those of run charts. Data for a particular indicator are plotted as dots on a simple graph, with time plotted in chronological sequence on the x-axis, and the value of the measurement or indicator of interest plotted on the y-axis. The time intervals are sequential and often regularly spaced, but need not be. The dots are connected by lines, but this time the centre line is the mean line. The control chart has two additional lines compared to a run chart, the upper and lower control limits, and these define the variability in the data. They are different from confidence intervals or standard deviations and shouldn't be confused with these. Control limits are lines representing estimates of the dispersion or boundaries in the data. Standard deviations are used in specific charts of normally distributed variables such as physiological measures including glucose or cholesterol. Means and control limits should be calculated according to the population sample size and type of data. And this is usually done using computer software. Rules for control charts include a single point outside the control limit, a shift where eight or more data points are above or below the mean, trends where six or more data points go successively up or down, and finally abnormal variability where two or three successive values are more than two sigma limits or control limits from the mean. The control chart shows hypnotic prescribing data for a single general practice corresponding to the previous run chart.
we can see that the second dot in the sequence falls above the upper control limit. A shift, or a sequence of eight dots below the mean, is also present from January 2008. We can see that this practice has significantly reduced its hypnotic prescribing. Finally, as well as looking at an indicator across a period of time, control charts can also be used to compare organisational units at a single point or during a fixed period of time. In this type of control charts, organisational units are arranged on the x-axis with their performance as a count, rate or proportion on the y-axis. The mean is represented on the chart and control limits are calculated for each organisational unit based on all the data provided. The control limits are denoted by the outer curve lines, which when data are arranged according to the size of the sample denominator provided by each organisational unit, produces a funnel plot. The funnel plot shown shows care bundle performance for acute myocardial infarction or heart attack in 12 regional ambulance services in England. Each service is represented by a dot labelled between 1 and 12. The sample denominator varies from a few cases in service 12 to over 200 cases in service 7 in the month that performance is measured. You can see that the mean performance across all services is around 45%. Control limits are wider for services with small samples of heart attack and become narrower as the sample size increases. And this produces the characteristic funnel shape of the control limits. Because this looks like the bell of a trombone, funnel plots are sometimes referred to as trombonograms. Thank you for listening to this webinar. If you'd like some further information, please go to our further reading and the contact information on the slides.